What do a back tattoo, Pulp Fiction, and Donald Glover have in common? They're all Easter eggs you might have missed in the MCU. It was the unexpected success of Iron Man that gave Marvel Studios the jumpstart it needed. That said, it also helped that the filmmakers sneaked in little references here and there to a larger universe. This includes a prop that only eagle-eyed viewers caught, the shield of World War II hero Captain America. It's partially constructed and sitting idly on Tony Stark's work desk. In a 2010 interview with MTV, director Jon Favreau explained that the movie's inclusion of the iconic symbol was nothing more than a visual gag, at least at first. He explained, an industrial light and magic artist put it in there as a joke to us for our CineSync sessions, when we're approving visual effects. They liked it enough that they kept it in the film's final cut. In The Incredible Hulk, Emil Blonsky receives a special serum that transforms him into the Abomination, a monster intended to be Hulk's physical match. The container holding the serum bears a label attributing its development to a certain Dr. Reinstein, a name familiar to longtime Captain America readers. Dr. Reinstein was actually a fake name used by Dr. Abraham Erskine, the man who developed the super soldier formula that turned the scrawny Steve Rogers into America's mightiest champion. Interestingly, the final cut of The Incredible Hulk could have featured more than a passing reference to the captain had things turned out the way the director originally intended. A deleted scene actually included a cameo of the star-spangled Avenger's frozen body preserved underneath the Arctic ice. Aside from introducing new heroes Black Widow and War Machine, Iron Man 2 also delved deeper into the Avengers initiative, exploring how it would be executed while emphasizing that Stark may not be a good addition to the project. Prone to self-destructive tendencies. I was dying. I mean, please. And aren't we all? Interestingly, the scene where Fury delivers the not-so-good news to Stark contains an early reference to the existence of a hero who would eventually fight alongside the Avengers, the Black Panther. The sequence features the two men sitting down in a covert location and discussing Black Widow's assessment of Stark. Beside Stark and Fury are some S.H.I.E.L.D. holographic screens that depict a map of the world with certain locations marked. The marker that certainly got a lot of attention, though, is the one that pointed to a seemingly secret location in Africa, the technologically advanced, vibranium rich nation of Wakanda. In the scene where Thor is proclaimed by his father Odin as Asgard's next king, we see their sworn enemies, the Frost Giants, making their way through the palace walls and into the vault where precious artifacts are kept by the All-Father. Seeking to obtain the casket of ancient winters, they struck a deal with Thor's trickster brother Loki that allowed them to sneak into the palace undetected. However, when the invaders attempt to take the relic, the destroyer comes to life and takes them down. In the chaos that follows, the Infinity Gauntlet is shown for a brief moment on screen. However, as Hela casually revealed in Thor Ragnarok, the gauntlet in Odin's vault was a counterfeit. This throwaway line of dialogue was meant to address a massive plot hole that was created when Avengers Age of Ultron showed the gauntlet in the possession of Thanos all along. Set during the Second World War, the first Captain America movie told the tale of how a scrawny, bullied kid from Brooklyn was gifted with a superhuman physique to match his superheroic heart. Initially deemed too expensive and risky to send out into actual combat, Captain America soon took the lead in fighting Hitler's men. Wait a minute. An American adventurer in an iconic costume going up against German forces? If that sounds familiar to you, perhaps you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. In case that connection isn't enough, there's a line of dialogue uttered by the Red Skull that's meant to remind you of the classic Indiana Jones flick. Early on in the movie, the Red Skull finds the Tesseract in a town in Norway. And the Führer digs for trinkets in the desert. Avid moviegoers will likely draw the connection between this line and Hitler's quest to find the Ark of the Covenant in Raiders. There's a scene in The Avengers that features Captain America training at the gym. Fury shows up with a briefing and an invitation to join the Avengers initiative. While Fury's papers contain important information, it's the name of the agent who prepared it that makes it even more fascinating than it already is, at least for comic book fans. Upon closer inspection of the first page of the document, the name Mephisto is in the caption under the photo of the Tesseract. This codename appears to refer to the S.H.I.E.L.D. operative who helped the agency acquire data about the powerful artifact. However, some might have speculated that this was a reference to the Marvel Comics demon of the same name, a malevolent extra-dimensional force who uses mystical means and trickery to cause all sorts of mayhem in the Marvel Universe. Over time, Mephisto became an in-joke among MCU fans because of all the debunked conspiracy theories about the demon's supposed involvement in the events of WandaVision. But hey, at least we can say that the MCU technically does have a Mephisto, kinda. 
During the battle between Iron Man and Aldrich Killian, Tony lops off Killian's left hand. In Thor The Dark World, Loki makes it appear that he chopped off Thor's hand in order to trick the Dark Elves. In Captain America The Winter Soldier, Bucky Barnes resurfaces as the villain, with his entire left arm missing. In Guardians of the Galaxy, Groot loses both arms because of Gamora, while Claw gets his arm swiftly chopped off by Ultron in Avengers Age of Ultron. Lastly, in Ant-Man, when Scott Lang disables the Yellow Jacket suit with Darren Cross still inside it, the villain's right arm shrinks first before the rest of him does. In an interview with Cinema Blend, Kevin Feige confirmed that the phase-wide Easter egg was a nod to Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. He said, It didn't start out as intentional, but it became intentional. In one scene of Thor The Dark World, there's a chalkboard full of notes from Dr. Eric Selvig and Dr. Jane Foster related to the possible destruction of Earth due to the cosmic event called the Convergence. Eager fans noticed that the board contained references to real-world science and Thor's comic book lore. The book Thor The Dark World, The Art of the Movie, released in the same year, has a laymanized list of the items on the board. The chalkboard mentions phenomena related to black holes, how matter changes from one state to another, electromagnetic forces, and even string theory. It also has some terms that comic readers would doubtlessly recognize, such as 616 Universe, the nexus of all reality, and the crossroads. Simple. Any questions? Captain America The Winter Soldier introduced some significant changes to the MCU. For starters, it features Bucky as the Winter Soldier and contains the first appearance of the Falcon. Perhaps most importantly, it reveals the sinister truth behind S.H.I.E.L.D., which had become infested with HYDRA agents. Nick Fury even has to fake his own death so he can continue to work behind the scenes and bring down the corrupted agency. The biblical passage engraved on his tombstone, ascribed to Ezekiel 25:17, will no doubt be familiar to longtime fans of Samuel L. Jackson. It's part of his dialogue in one of the most iconic sequences from the famous 1994 crime film Pulp Fiction. The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. In an interview, directors Joe and Anthony Russo shared that they decided on the verse following the suggestion of the film's effects supervisor. For a brief period of time, there was speculation that Stan Lee would not show up in Guardians of the Galaxy due to the fact that he didn't have a hand in their creation. That's why fans were delighted when the film's final cut did in fact contain a cameo from the man himself, complete with his signature line, Excelsior, flashing on the screen in a made-up alien language. However, this was actually not the original plan for Lee's cameo. In an interview with director James Gunn, he confirmed that initially Lee was supposed to be a specimen in the treasure room of the Collector and was supposed to throw a rude gesture at Groot. Gunn also said that he decided to scrap the cameo from the film on his own and that it wasn't a studio mandate as rumored. Avengers Age of Ultron confirmed what many audiences probably already knew about Tony Stark. He had contingency plans in place if the technology he frequently relied on ever got disabled or compromised. Following the transfer of his previous AI assistant Jarvis into the body of Vision, Stark was in need of a replacement. Stark picks out Friday, which becomes his new guidance system. However, fans also caught a glimpse of some of the program cards that Stark didn't select, and two of them bore names that were quite familiar to Marvel Comics fans. One of the cards was labeled Jocasta, which longtime readers of the Avengers comic books would know is the name of the robot that was built by Ultron to be his partner. Meanwhile, another card bore the name Tadashi, a reference to the inventor of the AI program behind Baymax in the Disney film Big Hero 6. The organization known as the Ten Rings has been an established threat in the background of the MCU since Iron Man. However, what most fans may not know is that in 2015, Ant-Man almost featured a blink-and-you'll-miss-it reference to the terrorist faction in its final cut. In a commentary track for the film, Ant-Man lead Paul Rudd and director Peyton Reed spill the beans on a short scene that was omitted from the movie. After PIM Technologies, CEO Darren Cross was able to unlock the shrinking secrets of PIM particles, he immediately invited a group of prospective buyers to a demonstration at the company. In the deleted scene, a tattoo of the Ten Rings was partially visible on the neck of one of the potential investors, implying that he was actually a member who wanted to get his hands on the shrinking technology. During the big showdown between Team Cap and Team Tony at the airport in Germany, there's a scene where Ant-Man and Captain America use PIM particles to turn a shrunken vehicle into an expanding projectile. For a few seconds, we get a glimpse of a unique vehicle that should be instantly recognizable to fans of the sitcom Arrested Development, the Bluth Company Stair Car, missing the company's logo on the side. 
There's a good reason for this Easter egg. The Russo brothers actually directed the pilot of Arrested Development years before they got into the business of directing MCU films. As fans of the show would attest, the Bluth family car wasn't exactly known for being a smooth ride and was even used in a few wacky situations. Let's just be thankful that it didn't cause our heroes any trouble. Doctor Strange featured a simple but clever gag that was even used in the film's trailer. When Stephen Strange arrives at the mystical sanctuary in search of the Ancient One, her student Mordo hands Strange a piece of paper with the word Shambhala on it. He asks what it's for, instantly assuming that it's some sort of magical incantation. Mordo's response? The Wi-Fi password. We're not savages. Of course, because this is a Marvel movie, you can bet that there's an interesting meaning behind the word. Published in 1986, the 23rd issue of the Marvel graphic novel series features a story called Doctor Strange into Shambhala. The book follows Doctor Strange as he travels to the Ancient One's homeland and eventually arrives at a magical moral quandary. We won't spoil the rest of the story for you so that you can read it yourself. When we see Stan the Man himself in Guardians Volume 2, he's wearing a spacesuit and sitting on an asteroid. He's not alone though, as three watchers are listening to him talk about other adventures. In other words, as one Twitter user put it, Stan Lee was canonically a Watcher informant and was playing the same character in every MCU movie. Director James Gunn responded to this tweet by admitting that fan theories on Twitter were what prompted him to shoot this lighthearted Stan Lee scene. Kevin Feige himself acknowledged that the late Marvel legend transcends the reality of the MCU. As cool as it is, this scene did create a bit of a continuity error, though. Lee mentions being a FedEx delivery man, which was his cameo in Captain America Civil War, a film that supposedly took place after this one. To his credit, Gunn acknowledged the error. There's a scene in Spider-Man Homecoming where Peter Parker makes use of voice-changing Stark technology to sound more intimidating during an interrogation attempt. Hilariously, it doesn't work on his target, Aaron Davis. Deactivate interrogation mode. This sequence is special for two reasons. It teases the existence of another spider person, and it's the culmination of a seven-year-old campaign to put Donald Glover in a Spider-Man movie. Davis is, of course, the uncle of Miles Morales, aka the Spider-Man from the Ultimate Universe who now occupies the main Marvel Earth. While the MCU's Davis doesn't say Morales' name, he does mention that he has a nephew, which is more than enough confirmation. Back in 2010 when the Spider-Man reboot was announced, hashtag Donald for Spider-Man went viral on Twitter as Glover's fans pushed for him to be considered for the lead role. Of course, Andrew Garfield was eventually cast as the web-slinger. Years later, Spider-Man Homecoming director John Watts swore to find a way to include Glover in this Spider film, and the rest, as they say, is history. In Thor Ragnarok, Thor finds himself trapped on the waste planet of Sakaar. He becomes an unwilling participant in the Contest of Champions. The Grandmaster honors previous victors by adding their sculptures on the tower of his palace, which already has a few familiar faces on it. Eagle-eyed fans will have noticed the faces of the mystical guardian, the Man-Thing, the war god, Ares, and the Hulk villains, Bybeast and Darkcrawler on the tower. The most significant face there belongs to none other than Beta Ray Bill, a horse-faced, genetically modified member of the Corbinite race and an ally of Thor in the comics who wields the powerful weapon Stormbreaker. Kevin Feige revealed that Beta Ray Bill originally had a slightly bigger role in Thor Ragnarok, but he was cut from the film. As he told Crave Online, the feeling is, if you can't do a character like Beta Ray Bill justice, do it later. When T'Challa successfully subdues Ulysses' claw after a long chase, the villain begs for mercy from the Wakandan king. The superhero responds, Every breath you take is massive from me. It's an awesome line that, unbeknownst to many moviegoers, is actually taken from New Avengers Volume 3, number 22, in which T'Challa says it to Namor. T'Challa already had a major axe to grind with the arrogant Atlantean king before that issue, as Namor once caused tremendous suffering to many Wakandans as a result of what could charitably be called a petty grudge. By the time the two kings found themselves on the same team, their animosity had already reached a boiling point, leading to a brutal confrontation and Namor's abrupt departure from the team. While audiences were happy to see Spider-Man become formally integrated into the MCU with the release of Spider-Man Homecoming, the apparent absence of his famous spider sense throughout the film became a serious point of contention. In a 2017 interview with Collider, Spider-Man Homecoming director John Watts explained the decision to make the spider sense less of a presence in his film. He said, The idea was, again, just you want to make this movie be less about things you've already seen before, and you've definitely already seen a spider sense sequence done extremely well in Mark Webb's and Sam Raimi's movies. 
Despite Kevin Feige's confirmation that the MCU version of Peter definitely possesses a spider sense and that they would explore it further down the line, fans still eagerly awaited the day they'd witness this version of the Web Slinger's spidey sense in action. That day eventually came in Avengers Infinity War, although Aunt May would eventually refer to it by a different name. Please do not start calling it my Peter Tingle. While most of Ant-Man and the Wasp explores Scott's life under house arrest following his participation in the Civil War battle, it also introduces another size-changing superhero from the comics, Dr. Bill Foster, aka Goliath. The movie doesn't really show Foster engaging in heroics the same way Ant-Man and the Wasp do, but it does mention his time working with Dr. Hank Pym as a S.H.I.E.L.D. scientist. In the scene where Dr. Foster is shown lecturing to a classroom full of students, the chalkboard behind him is full of mathematical equations. It also has the word Matrix written on it, which, while a perfectly appropriate word for the situation, can also be interpreted as a reference to Fishburne's iconic role as Morpheus in The Matrix. Marvel legend Stan Lee was able to film a few extra cameo appearances for a handful of Marvel movies before his death in 2018. One such Easter egg was for Captain Marvel. During the sequence, where Carol Danvers searches for a Skrull agent in Los Angeles, she briefly encounters Lee sitting by one of the windows. The comic book writer is shown reading the script for the 1995 film Mallrats, which he also appeared in. Speaking to The Hollywood Reporter, Mallrats director Kevin Smith expressed his delight at the nature of Lee's cameo in Captain Marvel and how it referenced his film. It was really kind of poetic, and to hear him saying his line, which to be fair was some shit that he would say in real life all the time, trust me, true believer, it was everything. Smith must have been thrilled by the fact that this was basically confirmation that a version of him exists in the MCU. One of the best things about Avengers Endgame is the way the main characters are able to revisit some of their most iconic moments. In the case of Steve Rogers, his visit to the past allowed him to play things a bit smarter in a situation very similar to that elevator fight scene from The Winter Soldier. This time, instead of beating up an elevator full of Hydra agents, Rogers is able to bypass a violent confrontation. Hail Hydra. This works, and Rogers is seen seconds later exiting the elevator with the scepter. While this scene doubtlessly calls back to Cap's elevator fight, it's also a sly reference to a controversial 2016 comic. Captain America Steve Rogers No. 1, in which Rogers is revealed as a secret Hydra agent, a move that unsurprisingly riled fans of the character. That backlash was so fierce that Marvel had to ask for readers to be patient while the story unfolded. When Peter Parker was officially introduced to the MCU in Civil War, the character also revealed a bit about his origin during a candid conversation with Tony Stark. Their talk made it clear that it was some sort of grave personal tragedy that served as Peter's wake-up call, making him realize that he needs to fight for the little guy. This seemed to hint at his existence, but there was no formal mention of Peter's uncle Ben Parker in Spider-Man Homecoming. Fans didn't like the omission of arguably the most important figure in Spider-Man's world. Perhaps that's why the inclusion of the initials BFP on Peter's travel briefcase in Spider-Man Far From Home was so well received. It's the first real evidence that Uncle Ben existed in the MCU as well as a memorable Easter egg. Black Widow gave MCU fans the opportunity to know more about Natasha Romanoff's past and adoptive family as well as what she got up to after the events of Civil War. Interestingly, it also answered a question that few people probably bothered to ask. How did she get that cool-looking vest? As it turns out, the vest belonged to Natasha's sister and fellow Black Widow operative Yelena Belova. The younger widow proudly shares to her big sister, whom she has not seen for more than two decades, that the vest is the first thing she ever bought for herself. After the final showdown, the two sisters say their loving goodbyes, but not before Belova leaves her vest with Romanoff as a parting gift. The touching gesture confirms that the bond between them remains strong as ever. Arguably, this also made Belova's reaction to the news of Romanoff's death so much more emotional and believable. In the scene where Shang-Chi and Katie enter the Golden Daggers Club, they are given a quick tour of the place by the host. While most MCU fans will have no doubt spotted the fight between the Abomination and Wong, there is another noteworthy fight featuring two combatants deeply tied to MCU history. In one of the cells where the fight takes place, a Black Widow, who was rescued during the events of the Black Widow movie, is seen squaring off against a soldier whose body has been enhanced by the virus from Iron Man 3. While the Widow appears to get the upper hand by using her knives, she is later seen tending to the soldier's wounds, reinforcing that not all of the combatants in the club see each other as enemies outside of the ring. 
The second post credit scene of Eternals sets up the introduction of not one but two classic Marvel heroes. After the disappearance of Cersei, her beau, Dane Whitman, is seen opening a box containing what appears to be a family heirloom, a sword that has clearly been kept wrapped and hidden for a long time. This is of course the Ebony Blade, the weapon that Whitman wields as the medieval-themed superhero the Black Knight. As the nervous human attempts to touch the blade, he hears a voice saying, Sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? The scene abruptly ends without revealing who the mysterious voice belongs to. In an interview with Empire Online, director Chloe Zhao confirmed that the line was spoken by Mahershala Ali, the MCU's version of Blade. She said, I gotta say, in just the little time I spent with Mahershala, I can't wait for the Blade movie to come out. Given the sheer amount of nostalgic references incorporated into Spider-Man No Way Home, it's hard to choose the best among all of its Easter eggs. For instance, the entire conversation between the three Peters during the climactic battle is in itself one Easter egg after another. The bit where Andrew Garfield offers to crack Maguire's back to relieve its stiffness is a clever nod to Maguire's infamous back problems during the development of Spider-Man 2. The filmmakers even managed to sneak in a scene where the three Peters recreate that famous pointing meme from the 1960s Spider-Man cartoon. However, if we had to pick just one Easter egg as the best of the lot, it would have to be how Garfield's Spider-Man saves MJ from falling to her death. As fans who saw The Amazing Spider-Man 2 will recall, he was unable to save the love of his life, Gwen Stacy, who died in a strikingly similar situation. It nearly drove him to hang up the webs for good, and by saving the girlfriend of an alternate reality version of himself, he gained some much-needed closure. Garfield says a lot with his face alone in this scene, one of the standout moments in the movie. When Doctor Strange and America Chavez go multiverse hopping, they become stranded on Earth-838, where an alternate version of Strange seemingly sacrificed his life to defeat Thanos. However, the traveling duo are detained in the Baxter Foundation, where the mainstream MCU Strange learns the horrific truth about his counterpart's death. Here, Strange also meets the Illuminati, a covert group of heroes who secretly determine the best course of action against major threats. The Illuminati of Earth-838 is made up of Mordo, Captain Marvel, the Inhuman King Black Bolt, Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four, Captain Carter, and their leader, Professor Charles Xavier. This incarnation of Professor X sits in his yellow hover chair from the 90s comics. Additionally, when he is introduced, a brief segment of the iconic X-Men the Animated Series theme plays. In one scene of Thor Love and Thunder, Zeus uses his godly powers to flick away a restrained Thor's garments. He overdoes it though, which leaves Thor thoroughly exposed to the stunned crowd. We get a good view of Thor from behind, which shows that he has a big tattoo on his back to honor his brother Loki. Right next to it is another tattoo, shaped like a roll of parchment, bearing some of the names of Thor's loved ones who have passed away. His mom and dad are there, as are Heimdall, Tony, and Natasha. Interestingly, according to director Taika Waititi, this easter egg was cut from Thor Ragnarok. However, they deemed it too good to waste, so they made it bigger for Thor Love and Thunder.